Okay, we are live. We are recording. Phone lines will remain off. Go for it. Thank you very much. Good evening and welcome to the June 14th Flag Day edition of the uh, planning board of the town of East Hampton. Um, we have um, mostly uh, site plan reviews tonight uh, on uh, the Project Most uh, Community Learning Center, GSL Shop Edition, and Three Mile Harbor Affordable Housing. Before we do that, we're going to have a presentation on the uh, senior center that uh, is um, being uh, proposed or rejected by the town. Uh, Jeremy Samuelson, our uh, planning director, is going to uh, speak, and then we're going to hear from I think the architects on the plan. And they'll be here remotely. Matt, you can open up the, uh, the, the phone lines so that they can hear and... Uh, when oh, okay. So I have six people in the waiting room. Should I just let them in? Yeah. Okay, letting them all in now. Thank you, sir. Good evening, members of the planning board. Uh, I am here to just give you a very quick introduction and then turn it over to the architects for uh, the senior center. So a couple details I'd like to share with you right out of the gate is that the, the town has entered into a formal design process to uh, renew or replace is probably a better way of putting it, the 100 year old building that is uh, very uh, near the intersection of Three Mile Harbor Road and Springs Fireplace Road, actually on Springs fireplace road as you travel north into springs on the right hand side this facility uh, i think has been kind to the community but has done its service and is beyond its uh, appropriate lifespan at this point so the town has taken a or undertaken i should say a formal design process uh, that was subject to an rfp and had uh, good evening uh, that had uh, a bunch of respondents to it but there was one team that stood out and that, that was a combined architecture firm that i'll introduce in in just a moment. I just want to give you a, a little overview of what you're being asked to do and what your role is both in this broader process and very specifically what you're being asked to look at and think about this evening. I do want to point out that we have uh, in the audience with us this evening the director of the Department of Human Services, uh, Diane Patrizio, so my counterpart over at the, the Senior Center, uh, who leads the programs there. I uh, hate to put you on the spot, but I assume would be happy to answer a question or two if they come out uh, as part of this conversation. Uh, this entire design initiative has been led by town board member Kathy Burke Gonzalez, who's also here, and I imagine is happy to answer any questions uh, if that's useful to the board's conversation this evening. So the, the site that you will be presented with information about this evening is a new site. It's not where I was describing to you uh, off of Springs Fireplace Road, where the current site is. This is actually off of Abraham's Path. So if you're familiar with the Terry King ball field, if you stood there in the middle of Abraham's Path and you looked at home plate on the ball field, there's a whole uh, stretch of woods off to the right-hand side there. And up until uh, probably about two Two years ago at this point, that was actually a 14 acre parcel that one family had uh, owned for a very long time. And they decided at one point to go ahead and make available to the town about seven acres of that property. It's accessed, as you'll see, uh, on the overhead uh, through a flag strip. So you're approaching the back of the property. And that is, uh, again, about seven acres where the design uh, that you'll be presented with is situated. So it does abut uh, the Terry King ball field on the north, and it has the MTA right of way for the Long Island Railroad on the south. You're really being asked this evening to take the first of three steps as part of your contemplation of uh, this broader review. So this is a town project, so it actually doesn't, as, as you've seen with other town projects, require you to formally approve the actual design or the, uh, the site plan that will eventually land in front of you. Uh, municipal projects are handled, again, as you know well, slightly differently than uh, public or private projects. 
uh, that uh, land uh, in front of the planning board. So really this evening is meant to stay at 30,000 feet. We have uh, renderings for the property and the general layout, where the ingress and egress will be, where the building is, the approximate size of it, where the parking would go. And what you're being asked to do is offer a general reaction. Are there strong reactions that you have in favor or opposed to what's being shared with you this evening? Do you, given your expertise as members of the planning board, see something that you want to flag early enough in the process that it could and be put back into the hopper, as it were, and actually contemplated as part of any amendments that may be necessary to the design. What we're not asking you to do this evening is to do a deep dive, right? If we start looking at things where we say, well, how many tables are you depicting in this room here? When I look at this overhead, I'm going to ask you to, you know, pull back on the joystick, you know, to uh, uh, get back up to that 30,000 foot level and really ask yourself those big picture questions. You know, how is it that this nestles into the property? Is it roughly an appropriate set of uses and layout within the property? Would it be better if this broad uh, piece of it over here were somehow applied or considered to be applied to a different corner of the property. Those are the types of big picture questions that you're being asked to contemplate this evening. To articulate the other two steps that will eventually land in front of you, there will be a need to formally subdivide this parcel off from that broader 14 acres that I was talking about a few moments ago. Um, as you may know, the, the town sometimes when it begins these processes in order to facilitate a transaction uh, will use a, a common technique here, which is to purchase a described area of a broader parcel. So in other words, you, know, you can say, we're going to, uh, through a description of meets and bounds, buy these seven acres uh, of a 14-acre parcel, not those seven acres of a 14-acre parcel. And what that does is it allows the town to formally take ownership, which is what's happened here, and the subdivision process actually comes later. As you all know, you have the ability to steer and uh, have an input or have input on a subdivision process. It remains a formal step for which we will need to come back to you at some future time. I will ask you to set that aside broadly as a future set of actions that you'll be asked to formally undertake. That's the second step uh, of three that I mentioned. The third step is actually the formal site plan review that will happen later. Again, just for the record, you, you won't be asked as part of that third step in the future to formally approve. You will be asked to pass judgment on and make recommendations to the town board. That's a more detailed process where you do get deeper into the weeds, but tonight, again, we're asking you to stay at 30,000 feet. Your comments this evening will be memorialized in a set of memos. Those will be turned over to the town board for their consideration as they continue to work with the design team and move this project forward. So I'll pause there uh, before I introduce the architects and see if you have any questions that you'd like to ask me about the process or what you're being asked to do. Okay, so I'm hoping through, oh, and I can see uh, the, the folks from the design team on the screen over here, we actually have uh, the benefit of two architecture firms, quite standout groups that we've been very fortunate to work with uh, as part of this. So you have Ronette Riley, uh, if you don't mind waving so folks can see who's, can who's see. who here. You've got the PowerPoint, I presume it's a PowerPoint. That is, and I'll, I'll walk you through that. So we can turn that ever so slightly so you all will be able to actually sort of see uh, who's addressing you. Um, actually, Tina, do you mind just turning that a little bit so that folks can see? So Ronette Riley, if you don't mind giving uh, one, one more wave here. Uh, she She's in the center square for our, our Hollywood Squares edition of Planning Board, East Hampton Town Planning Board. Um, she is the principal for R2, an architecture firm uh, that has roots in many places in, including here on the South Fork. Uh, her counterpart, Carol Ross Barney. Carol, if you don't mind waving, uh, from RB Architects. Uh, her design firm uh, has been the, the other uh, critical player here. And I believe that uh, you, you have many folks there, but the other person who may be speaking also from RB Architecture is Lena Reef. And Lena, if you don't mind waving, just so folks know who you are. With that, I will get out of your way. I'll advance the slides. If there's anything I can help you with, please ask. Thanks very much. Um, LTV, can you, oh, there you go. Um, the presentation is very hard to see for the audience. I don't know if you want to reproduce it. I can turn it back this way now. 
Right. They're not going to be able to see the folks who are well, talking to us after the presentation. They won't be able. To, they only have a little tiny box mm -hmm. to the presentation. Oh, okay, you want to do that? We can share. You see, right. see that? Yeah. Yep. Right. Yep. Just a tiny bit more. All right. Um, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you. Um, thanks, Jeremy, for the introduction. Um, uh, I think we're ready for the next slide. Oh, I think you just went to the last slide on accident. <laughs> Arrow back. That was a quick presentation. Quick presentation. We said it would be quick. Um, all right. So what we wanted to start with was um, just a slide talking about how we got to where we are right now and a little bit about the program origin. So up at the top, we just wanted to remind everybody that um, what we did at the beginning of the project was a very extensive community engagement process. Um, there were in-person visits, there were surveys that were taken out, and we really tried to get information from, you know, not just um, elected representatives, um, but residents, community members, users of the center, and staff that works in the center every day. So we tried to holistic you know, get get facts and see what people wanted um, from all walks of uh, who would be using the building. And so we saw a few different themes and also kind of goals and priorities that we took from those themes. And so kind of looking down the list, you can see one of the biggest ones we saw was a connection with nature and the outdoors, um, which we're really excited about on this site. We think we can um, kind of provide that with the design of the building. Also activities that build on the existing center, but also, um, you know, could we design program spaces for new activities and, and different things for the seniors to do? Um, looking at things and, you know, spaces that are dedicated to the arts, but also spaces that are dedicated to um, more of wellness opportunities. Could there be um, a space, especially the dining room, that could be a, a spot for social interactions and really highlighting that as that's one of the biggest uses um, of the current center? Um, looking at the design, um, not only as a building, but also for site opportunities, how can we look at the entire site and provide, um, you know, things like walking trails or outdoor areas, um, but then also looking at the, um, the building and the design to be environmentally conscious um, and having, you know, goals and priorities towards net zero, which we'll kind of talk about as well in this presentation. And then also looking at um, appreciation of the staff, you know, there's people in here that work every day um, and just trying to make that space um, nice for them as well. And so you can see how those themes uh, relate directly to the goals and priorities. So trying to make this a space that's a home away from home, you know, bringing back that net zero energy goal, um, how close can we get to that? Um, making the, the building feel open and airy, um, you know, it, can it be a space for lectures, seminars, um, wellness activities? Can it be flexible for all of that? Um, engaging both, you know, the mind, body, soul, um, while also providing, you know, enough parking spaces so that we can uh, have as many people in town participate in the activities as want to. And then, you know, having spaces inside like coffee bars, places to eat, you know, have those social interactions, but also providing the, the outdoor areas for people to gather as well. And so I think you'll kind of see that as we, we go through the slides. Next slide. Perfect. Okay. So this is the site plan and Jeremy, you're doing the control, right? So I might have you start to zoom in on, on different spaces, but like Jeremy said before, on the Western side, you can see Abraham's path. Um, that is where the entry and exit is for the site. Up to the North, you can see we share a line with Terry King ball field. Um, also kind of on the East side, the horse farm, and then the railroad kind of cuts along our South side of the site. So zooming in a little bit on uh, what we're going to call the pole portion of the site, um, you know, because it looks like a flagpole. So we'll talk about the pole portion and then the main flag. What we're envisioning here is a vehicular drive um, that would lead from Abraham's path all the way up to the main portion of the site. And what we were thinking is that along this uh, vehicular drive, we could incorporate unimproved overflow parking. And so what we mean by that is unpaved, unstriped parking. Um, and we think that this could serve, you know, for people that don't mind walking a little bit extra to the center on a nice day, but also if people want to visit the Terry King ball field. So it could kind of serve both of the public facilities on this site. 
What we've also tried to do while looking at these unimproved parking is take note of uh, the trees that are on the site that are still healthy that we want to keep. So you can see from our legend up at the top, we've started to kind of note the existing to remain trees. So those are the gray ones with the solid line. Um, the existing to be removed trees, those have the dashed line. So those are mo mostly trees that we, we really do unfortunately need to move because of, you know, getting the road into or trees that are um, maybe diseased and, and won't be able to be stable in the new design. And then the green trees on the site uh, show the proposed trees that we want to have. And so with this unimproved overflow parking, the idea behind this is to kind of make it go around the trees that are already healthy and existing. We want to keep as many of those trees on the site. And we're really looking, um, you know, not only to keep the above ground trunk and canopy safe, but in this uh, parking to keep the root structure safe as well. So we're trying to think about that as we move forward in this process. And then going on to, if you can scroll to the main uh, flag portion of the site, you can see that as you come up onto the more main portion of the site, you can either go into straight into the main parking area, or you can go down and loop into what we will have as a covered drop-off area in case you know a senior might need to get uh, assistance going into the building. So um, what we were looking at here is providing a shared street approach uh, with pavers. And we're kind of looking at, uh, you know, minimizing the surface runoff as much as possible. And we'll kind of nail down a little bit more of these surface materials as we go along in DD. But what we're looking at here with the shared street approach is um, having the drive be at the exact same level as the entryway. So we would be eliminating the need for a curb at all and instead providing bollards to separate vehicular traffic from pedestrian traffic. Um, looking from there, you can see that we can loop on up into the main parking and one can kind of park within any of those spaces. We've actually started to add more than the code minimum for handicapped parking spaces. Just with the nature of this building, we thought it might be nice to provide a few extra of those. So you'll see that on the plan as well. Um, we've also started to add, as you can see with the dash line above the top, you know, the two northernmost parking um, sections, we're looking at adding PV canopies. So kind of throughout this presentation, you'll hear us kind of note back to those net zero or sustainability goals that we have. And so we're working with our consultants now to see exactly what the square footage of photovoltaic canopies we would need, but we're thinking that we might be able to consolidate them to the northernmost um, parking regions on the site so that when you do drive down into the site, it's not the first thing that you see is these covered walkways or covered canopies. They're kind of pushed to the, the perimeter of the site. Um, then, as you can see, kind of coming from that main parking area, um, we have a service drive that kind of loops around that eastern portion of the site and leads to a majority of the staff parking that's on the south side of the site. Um, what we've really tried to do here is, you know, we've underlaid the topography lines um, so that you guys can see, but the site really is almost kind of like a bowl. So from the north all the way along the west to the south um, is really a, a pretty large hill. And so by having the service drive come around to the eastern portion of the site and have most of the parking be on that south, we're really reducing the amount of grading that we have to do on the site. And so, um, you know, we want to leave the site as untouched as possible and also, you know, reduce costs that would have uh, that we would have with grading as well. And so what we've tried to do to be cognizant of the neighbors, um, and I know Kathy and Jeremy are also, um, you know, have been really cognizant about the, the horse farm and the neighbors to the south is provide a small uh, landscaped buffer. And so you can see that in the dark green area on the east and also on the site, south. And so um, we're going to provide um, some landscaped area there to help kind of block um, seeing any cars that would be entering in um, to that staff parking area. We'd also be looking at hopefully providing PV canopies on this portion of the site as well. Um, there is a commercial kitchen aspect of this building, and so that really is taking a lot of the energy use. And so we're trying to um, provide canopies where we can um, and still keep them, you know, out of direct sight. Um, you'll also see on this site the kind of the more lime green areas. Um, those are going to be lawn, 
So on the eastern portion of the site here, uh, you can see that there's a lawn coming out from the main dining space. We're envisioning that this could be used by seniors. Maybe there's an outdoor yoga class that's happening. Maybe someone wants to have a little picnic area outside there. But that could be used on that site. Um, on the western portion of the building, um, we're looking at a little bit different of a layout. So we were thinking maybe we could utilize that hill to provide a terraced garden with stone seating so that on any given day, a senior can kind of pick which experience they want to have. You know, do you want to be out on a, on a lawn area or do you want to kind of enjoy this terraced garden um, and seating area on the side? And then you can see that kind of mint green color there. Um, over on the eastern side where the septic is located. We were thinking about having that be meadow and maybe a pollinator garden. And then the rest of the site we would like to keep um, existing to remain. So as untouched as possible in that area. You can also see that we're starting to incorporate a few walking trails um, along the site. That was something that was really brought up in the original community meetings, you know, being able to have outdoor areas for exercise. And so what we're thinking here is that we could have um, possibly three different walking trail experiences. The first one being um, a very easy walking trail, almost on completely uh, flat ground and a little bit shorter of a course that would wrap around that meadow or pollinator garden. Um, then we have a part, uh, walking trail number two, which kind of wraps around the western portion of the site. And this one is a little bit more difficult. You know, maybe if there's a senior that has a little bit more mobility or a staff member that would like to take a walk on their lunch break. And that one kind of goes up the terraced garden, up to the top of the hill and around there. And then there's an option three for a walking trail as well that you can see kind of peels off of that walking trail too and goes around um, the northern edge and the perimeter of the site and leads back into the main entrance of the building. And so we've really started to kind of look at each corner of the site and how we can design that based off what we heard um, from the earlier uh, community engagement. And then before we go into, you know, site metrics or anything like that, I think, is there any questions or we can, we can go on to the next slide, Jeremy. Perfect. So now we've started to kind of just call out a few of the, you know, calculations from the site. So up at the top, you'll see um, just the address, the overall lot square footage, and just the zone being an A3 semi-public facility. Um, so we, what we've tried to do is show the required setbacks and then the proposed. So on the front, it's a 70 foot, and we're actually quite a bit farther from that at 125 feet. From the side, um, the required setback is 40 feet. And we're also quite a bit from that at 144 on one site um, and 231 feet on the other side. Um, at the rear setback, um, that's where we get the closest. We're still within the required setbacks, but um, the reason that we're getting a little bit close on that is from what I explained before, keeping the building on the flattest portion of the site to reduce the amount of overall grading that we'll need to do. Um, and then looking at accessory setbacks, similar, um, we are over a little bit on the side like we showed um, from the site plan, and that's where we get close on both the horse farm and uh, the railroad side of the site. But what we're doing to kind of make a compromise with that is providing those seven foot buffers um, that we plan to landscape to kind of, you know, be a better neighbor to those neighbors as well. Um, for building coverage, the maximum building coverage uh, is 7% of the lot. Um, what we're looking at now is 9% of the lot, and that's what that's including is the drip edge and the overhangs. Uh, we feel that the overhangs are really important in this design. Um, you know, the entry overhang is going to provide um, a drop-off area that's partially covered for seniors, um, you know, if, in case it's raining or something like that. So we felt that was important. And then the overhangs on the east and west side of the building, those provide covered areas off of the dining for the seniors to eat and still have shade covering them. So, you know, it does bump up our, our coverage a little bit, but we felt like, you know, providing those overhangs, especially with um, the, the type of building and, and who it's for was important. And then moving down uh, maximum lot coverage, um, you know, you can see 25% is the maximum and we're proposing 34%. Really, we're, you know, we have a certain amount of parking that we're trying to keep and kind of bringing that staff parking around the edge um, and, and providing all of those drive aisles. 
um, for maximum building height. It's two and a half stories and 32 feet for a gable roof. We're actually under that. We're providing a completely one story building, um, which is going to be more cost effective, no elevator, no stairs, and it's also going to be easier for a senior to, to maneuver throughout the building. And then we only have a 26 foot high gabled roof. So below that as well. And then for parking spaces, um, we started out just, you know, talking casually with the town about how many they think they needed. Um, and so we started with the number of 120 spaces and then code would require us to have five accessible. Right now, including those unimproved parking spaces along the pole portion of the site, we're looking at 164 total spaces and we're actually providing over the code minimums um, with nine accessible spaces for the site. <coughs> All right, and then here we also wanted to include just a diagrammatic landscape plan. Um, so as you can see um, over on the eastern side on the pole portion, you can see a little bit better those overflowed parking. Um, so this could be potentially shared with the athletic fields. And what we're looking at here is, you know, native forbs and grasses at the site entrance and to preserve as many of the existing cherry trees as possible. So when we went on site, we saw that there were a lot of really nice cherry trees along what would be that entry drive. And so we think that could be a really nice entry sequence to preserve as many of those. And then also you can see um, a little bit clearer with this diagram, uh, you know, those terraced lawn areas. We really want to keep those to a minimum. We want to have um, little to no irrigation on the site. So we're really keeping it to an entry lawn so that we can have, you know, a nice entry sequence with maybe a flagpole and some uh, landscaped area there. And then also that landscaped lawn um, leading out from the dining and the wellness room on the eastern side of the site. You can also see kind of the purple and, you know, periwinkle pink areas of the, the diagram. And that's showing the open meadow, native forbs and grasses there. And then the rest is really just the green untouched portion of the site. And so we also wanted to show a few images of just some of the site surface materials we were looking at. So on the upper left hand part of the screen, you can see the pavers. So we were thinking that this would be for um, the plaza, you know, the entry sequence coming into the building, as well as those patios leading out of the dining into either the terrace garden or um, the lawn. On the upper right, you can see that's an example of a shared street. Um, this is what we were looking at at the entrance. We've done this um, successfully in other projects we've worked on. And you can see there's bollards there that kind of protect, protect the pedestrians from the vehicular traffic. Um, but it eliminates the curb. So you don't have to worry about seniors trying to, um, you know, take a step up when they might be, you know, looking around at other things. And then on the bottom, there's just a few other surface materials. So looking at decomposed granite for the walking paths, I'm thinking this could be a, a nice um, uh, surface material that would blend in with the site around it. And really with you know, the net zero aspect and, and the sustainability for this project, we wanna minimize the amount of impervious surfaces that we can. Um, and then on the lower right, you can see this is just an example of what maybe the stone benches could be out in the terrace garden. So we were thinking on a nice day, maybe there could be outdoor programs um, that could be centered around these spaces. Moving on to the next slide. This is looking at um, some of the trees and grasses. So um, a lot of the existing trees on the site are eastern white pines and of course those cherry trees that we talked about um, along the entry. And so the idea behind that is to preserve as many of these eastern white pine, cherry, and then oak trees shown on the upper right as well. On the bottom is some of the treatments we would like to bring into the site. So you can see on the bottom right, that would be the lawn grass for outdoor gatherings. This is just going to be trimmed a little bit shorter. It's going to be a little bit easier for people to maneuver around in. And then on the bottom left is the meadow, um, you know, prairie pollinator garden. Um, and so we think that that's kind of important to bring to the site too. And then we've also started looking at those neighboring buffer plantings. So this would be in those, you know, seven foot areas on the east side and on the south side that border with the uh, horse farm and also the railroad. And so starting to look at what plantings the town recommends, you know, off of the website, I'm starting to look at the different, um, you know, birds and, and native species and, and what they like as well. And so this is just 
um, kind of a first pass of what we're looking at there. And we hope to start to kind of nail down these surface materials and these plantings as we find out more information, you know, with our civil and, and our geotech reports and, and talk more with the town. <coughs> All right, and so then you know we have just a, a slide looking at the floor plan of the uh, of the center, just to help kind of orient us. And so, what we've shown here is the purple on the plan indicates the common use spaces. So these would be more of the senior centric spaces where they would spend most of their time. The teal um, or blue is going to be the staff spaces. The yellow is going to be the commercial kitchen, and then the orange or salmon color is going to be more of those support spaces. So the spaces that you don't really see, but help keep the building running. And so um, you can see the dashed lines um, kind of going along the plan as well. Those are those covered, um, uh, you know, the, the line of the roof above here. And so you can see in the front, we have um, kind of an extensive one to provide a covered drop off for the seniors. And then on the east and west sides, um, we're also providing, um, you know, a little bit of a canopy for um, outdoor eating if they would like to do that. And so you can see coming in from the vestibule, you're greeted in the um, immediately with the lobby. And then we were thinking about having a small cafe also be there so that, you know, seniors can congregate and socialize, um, you know, if they're coming before they go into the dining room or before they enter one of the wellness programs. Going up through onto the right or the eastern portion of the plan, that's the wellness wing. Um, and so we're providing a game room. Um, also providing, you know, an arts and crafts room and a media room and really looking at uh, where we can provide um, the most flexible spaces we can. So you can see in separating the media room and the arts and crafts room, we have um, a movable partition so that those rooms can be completely closed off and be two separate spaces or can be opened up for a larger space experience as well. Then on the end of the wing, um, and you'll kind of see this throughout each wing, um, you know, we're completely glazing the end to provide kind of a framed view outside into the forest beyond. And so this is where we have the main wellness room. And so we're thinking it could be really nice if there was a yoga class and, you know, while you're doing yoga, you can see out into the forest beyond. Um, also, you know, looking at the different types of programs that um, the center, the current center offers, you know, after hours programs could possibly happen in the game room. Um, and we could provide, you know, extra storage within the game room um, for them to use as well. We also are providing single user toilets within the uh, wellness room. Uh, it came to our attention during programming that, you know, definitely having toilets within a short walking distance for the seniors um, that might be participating in wellness activities is really important. Also by providing single use toilets here, they could, you know, also be used as dressing rooms if, if someone comes in and wants to have lunch and then change in one of these rooms before going to a wellness or arts and crafts activity. Moving from that onto the western or the left side of this plan, more of the staff area. So what we're looking to do here is to provide um, offices for um, the, you know, case manager, assistant manager, transportation, all of the things that we talked about with uh, the staff that they needed to, you know, kind of make this center run. Um, at the end, we're providing the director's office with a nice framed view out onto the site. And you'll see that all the offices are kind of on the north side of the site. So they have views out into, um, you know, the drop off area so they can kind of see what's going on in that portion of the site. We are also show the conference room on kind of that end of the wing there. So they're getting those nice framed views of the site. Um, and then you'll see kind of dots of those back of house support spaces in each of these wings. And what we're doing here is just working with the consultants to minimize runs and, you know, try to make the building work as best as possible there. So, so that's what you're kind of seeing with the electrical and MDF rooms. Um, we're also providing um, a break room in the staff uh, wing, and we're thinking that they could have a door out to where they also have access to that terraced garden or some of the outdoor seating in case a staff member wants to have lunch outside or go for a little walk on their lunch break. And then kind of leading into the main, you know, center portion, we have the dining room. And so we've tried to make this space as flexible as possible. So providing, you know, 
the nutrition and dining workstations, um, you know, per kind of the requests of the people that work there, but also providing, you know, a beverage station that could be movable for, you know, different events that could take place. And then providing the bulk of the bathrooms right off of the dining room, since this is one of the most used um, portions of the site. Also, you can see in the dining room, there's double doors that lead out. We're envisioning that there would be tables and chairs out here and that the dining on a nice day would kind of bleed out into the site as well. On the southern portion of the building, you can see the large yellow expanse. That's the commercial kitchen. We're working with our kitchen designer now to kind of tighten up and figure out exactly how we want that space to be laid out. But, um, you know, it would have ample space to uh, serve the dining room and then also serve the meals, um, the to-go meals that the, that the center gives out on a weekly basis as well. And then kind of mirroring that on the other side are the other support spaces that make the building run. So we have a large maintenance and storage, um, you know, trying to provide enough storage um, for the building and then, you know, water, electrical and mechanical. Right now, um, you know, going back to some of our net zero goals and sustainability, we're oversizing the mechanical for um, geothermal wells. And so we'd really like to incorporate that system into the building as we think it will run the most efficient. It will need um, less replacement than some other systems. And it really completes some of the goals of having the net zero building. What we included here was just um, a really schematic building section so you can kind of see um, the different parts and we're looking at the highest point being within that dining i think we have some images of it later in the presentation that we can show but that would be about 26 feet um, from the main grade um, of the the entry and so then you know we've talked about it a little bit throughout the presentation but um, just to kind of have one slide dedicated to it um, are the sustainability strategies we're looking at for this building so we want to be you know cognizant of those existing trees um, and not only like i said earlier their canopies but also their root spreads so you can see on the site plan we've started to really try to position the parking and the building um, not only on the flattest portions but also starting to look at where some of those biggest trees are on the site to make sure we don't end up um, bothering them or you know needing to remove them um, also looking at providing the PV canopies over the parking to help supplement the energy of the building. So working with our mechanical engineer to figure out, you know, how much energy we have, how many PVs we need, and kind of right sizing them and right locating them really on the site to where it's not the first thing that you see, um, but, you know, you can see how the building runs and, and what kind of helps the building, um, you know, go on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, providing landscaping with minimal to no irrigation and focusing on, you know, natural meadow and pollinator garden. That way, um, you know, we can really focus on the nature that's existing in the site and not having all these irrigated spaces. And then, you know, looking inwards to the building, providing ample daylighting on the interior, um, but then also walking trails on the exterior for user well-being. So, you know, when you're on the interior of the space, you'll see in some of the renderings that we have, do you, can you kind of feel like you're on the exterior of the space? And we think that could be really nice for the building. And then you can see, too, utilizing a gabled roof with overhangs to provide shading and, and decrease solar heat gain. So um, we're working with some of our sustainability engineers now and looking at the gabled roof and how, you know, um, we can reclaim some of the water that's coming off of that roof. Maybe we can cycle that back in to help with, um, you know, toilet flushing and different things like that. And then, you know, that gable roof also provides shade so that some of the programs that are happening inside, like dining, can happen outside on a nice day. Um, and then, like I said before, working with the engineers on the possibility of geothermal well systems and kind of what that all entails within the site. Um, and then reviewing the site surface materials to reduce runoff. Um, we'd really like to have as permeable as surfaces as we can, but also trying to understand what the soil profiles are on the site and kind of, you know, trying to find a good uh, middle point between those as we continue through DD. And then here we can just cycle through some of the uh, the renderings that we have of the site. This is an aerial view, so you can kind of see the entry sequence where someone would come in and drop off a senior under the covered awning. You can see the bollards there, and then that they would proceed into the main uh, parking area. On the lower left, you can see that's where some of the PV canopies are starting, so that would also provide some covered parking as well, which we think could be nice. And then this is also kind of a, you know, as you come in entry sequence. And so you can see 
the ends of the of the windmill um, of each of the wings and how that's really starting to frame out some of the views. And so, you know, on the wellness wing, we have uh, the wellness room that's framing that view. On the staff wing, we have the conference room and the director's office that are able to kind of see out. You can see who's coming into the site, but you're also able to see the nature beyond. And then this is a view from what we're calling the backyard. So you can see kind of at the bottom, this is where that service drive would come in. But we're starting to really think about it as a way to bring in meadow and pollinator grasses so that you're really not seeing any of those surface materials because we're providing a little bit of landscaping. You know, even though it's just a few feet high, it's starting to kind of mask that. And you can see here that the, oh, that the you know, just that the dining is starting to bleed out into the site. And so, you know, we're activating the building, but also, you know, the site is part of that. And so that's kind of the end of our presentation. You know, we just had a few questions, um, you know, to get the conversation started. But feel free if you guys have any questions to to go ahead. Thank you, Thank you very much for the comprehensive view of a very uh, ambitious project. Um, I don't know. I'm thinking that maybe we should just go around the table and see if people have uh, comments and... Uh, Looking at you, Ed. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, it's an amazing project. I mean, I know you guys have had a lot of public input, um, and for what I know about that input, it sounds like you've incorporated you know, most of the things that have been discussed. There's a lot of program here on Seven Acres. There's a lot happening here. Um, I think it looks really good. You know, uh, obviously, there's a you know little bit of uh, building coverage and lot coverage. Uh, going on here, but it feels to me like that's uh, justified. Um, I do, did have a couple of, uh, of questions. One is, what is the cladding on the outside? Is it, is it uh, that's the, the non-glazed surfaces on the exterior of the building? Are they cedar shakes or? You want me to do that one, Lena? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we, uh, we've been really inspired by the materials that we see um, around East Hampton. So the, what you're seeing in the drawing is a wood shingle. So what you and um, we are also we're also looking at making that wood shingle last longer. One of the problems with wood shingles is the maintenance that you incur when you decide to use that as a major material. So we have a couple other ideas that we'll be exploring during design development. One is to char the shingles. Um, this is a technique that's been used in Japan for a very long time. It's called uh, shoshugiban, mm -hmm. and by charring it. You, um, you prevent some of the deterioration. Some of the buildings that have charred materials, charred wood um, exteriors, um, have lasted for more than 100 years. Um, we are also looking at um, another material that would emphasize the shingleness of this rather than the material. And we're looking at a, a material that would be um, stainless steel. And um, we'll present more about those as we go along. Now, um, we think they both fit the cost profile we're trying to hit. But the other thing, is, what we really want to know is which one's more durable and which one is more appropriate for the community. So we'll be coming back with more information. Good. It sounds like you have that covered. Yeah, I, I know we don't want to get into details here. The Shushuki bond would be my vote. It sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so just in, broadly speaking, you know, I think, you know, minimizing the grading as you've done is really a positive thing. I like the buffer. Um, I like the terraced outdoor spaces. Um, I think that you've really done a great job here. I think you've done a great job. Just one other minor question, the 164 spaces, uh, parking spaces, does that include the sort of alternate ones uh, along the, the access driveway? Yes, it does. It does include those, okay. Yeah, I have no other comments. <laughs> now remember, we're you know we're we're, we're giving broad planning uh, yeah. input here, so it's our usual uh, purview of you know uh, in, impact on the uh, community and on uh, uh, water issues and uh, traffic issues, that sort of thing, in, in broad strokes to help with the development of this plan. And then uh, two clicks from now, we'll be have an opportunity to. Deep. Well, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm sorry to say that 
I don't have any criticism of this. <laughs> <laughs> it just uh, it looks beautiful. Uh, I like the sustainability strategies. I like all the green meadows. I like the trees. I like the shape of the building. It's modern looking. The access to it. I mean, everything about it is just great. And if this was a sales pitch, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> uh, the only thing, you know, when I looked at the, uh, the slideshow earlier at home, the only thing I picked up on is potential criticism. But then the more I thought about it, it really isn't is the uh, coverage and the setbacks on the south side and the east side. But on the east side, you've got, you've got a horse farm, which I don't think is really going to be affected. And on the south side, you have the railroad. So I, I don't think that's an issue. As far as the coverage is concerned, even though numerically it, it's uh, above what is normally allowed, just the look and feel of it, uh, it you know, doesn't really give you that sense that uh, it's overcrowded or, uh, you know, terrible density of the, uh, of the property. So, yeah, I mean, I, I really like the project and, uh, you know, full speed ahead, in my opinion. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's the first, the first look we're taking at it here, and obviously a lot of work has already gone into it, so... Um, hard to give, you know, much criticism or, or, or feedback at all, really. Um, I, I guess one question I have is the, the parking, if you don't include the ones along the, the pole section, what is the number of parking spaces? Would it meet code without those? Jeremy, would you be able to go to the site plan real quick? If that's too detailed, I can wait. Um, my, my hope would be that those spaces- I think we are yeah, I think we are right around that number. You know, the we were looking at the recommended or the let's see, the requested number as being 120 from the town, and I think we're really close to that. So, just to clarify for the board, uh, this qualifies under the code as what's referred to as a semi-public facility for which we don't have a distinct and articulated standard. So there's judgment that comes into play. There's such a wide latitude between different things that would fall into this category. So when, when the designers came to us and said, how many parking spaces are we required to have, there was not a definitive answer that we could provide. We talked with uh, the, the team that leads the center now, tried to do an analysis of what their current programmatic needs are and then anticipate how that would be proposed to expand here. And that's how we got to the recommended number of 120. There's nothing magic about that with the exception of tying it to the standard of therefore a minimum subset of five for the handicap accessible spaces. Okay, great. Yeah, I just, I think that it's a great idea and good planning to have and overflow extra spaces. I think practically they're probably not going to be the first choice by most people. So um, you all know more than me about the expected use and what parking you need, but it would be great if people can comfortably fit in the lot generally. And it sounds like you've done that. Um, and then, you know, again, I, I agree with Lou here, but it's not, not real criticism. I think it's a nice, a nice plan. It would be great if it were within coverage, um, building and total coverage, especially since we're incorporating so much outdoor activity space um that ship has probably sailed since i think the the land's been deeded and you sort of have to fit everything in the space that you have and i think you've done a good job with that um but that would just be a i guess a fifty thousand foot common if, if it were possible <laughs> to make the outdoor spaces bigger in the trails but again with the, the type of use here and all that's going on um and the public you know service element i think it's uh, it's appropriate and a, a nice plan and look forward to digging into it a little bit deeper when the next two steps come along. I'm going to go to Michael. I just had a question. You, you, you're going to have um, uh, uh, a full service kitchen. It looks like a, an industrial kitchen. Yeah. Where, uh, where are food deliveries to be made? What's the um, access point for that? Yes, exactly. So, um, you know, as you're coming off Abraham's path, you go up the pole portion of the site. And then what we were thinking there is you could just continue to keep going straight. Yep, exactly where Jeremy's putting us. And then you could loop around there. And so what we've done with that is provided a loop to where it's just one-way traffic for both deliveries to the kitchen and then also for seniors that are picking up meals. So no one has to stop, do a three-point turn, try to not hit the person next to them. It's just going to be a one-way loop in and right back out onto the site. 
and it's big enough to accommodate a, I don't think you'd get a 40, 40 foot van from delivering food, but a, a box truck or something that would be delivering food to the kitchen. It, it's exactly. We've actually, yeah, we've actually had to be right sizing it with civil for um, fire access. So all of the roads that you're seeing here are meeting fire truck, full fire truck turning radiuses. So anything that would be coming to the kitchen would also fall within that realm. And the kitchen, we have, could you bring up the, the, the drawing of the building that shows the different uses? No, keep going, keep going. That, uh, the, the, the kitchen is the yellow area over there? Yes. You have an access directly into the kitchen from that parking area that you showed? Yep. Okay. All right. Very good. I just wanted to make sure, because while we were talking about parking, that's... That. Yeah, yeah. So we were thinking that's where the deliveries could be. Um, and then also providing the covered awning there for when seniors come and pick up food. We don't have, you know, a staff member that's constantly just walking out on a bad day. Um, and so there's a little bit of coverage on that side of the building as well. Very good. Thank you, Michael. Uh, it's a great plan, a great project. I uh, really like the net zero goals. Uh, uh, the geothermal is fantastic and of course the photovoltaic and i'm sure we'll see in the next iteration where those are those solar panels are going to actually go on the site i didn't see them in the plan but they're not going to go on the roof is that no so jeremy if you don't mind going to the site plan real quick what we're starting to do is you know preliminarily lay them out um you can see kind of on those top two bays on the north of the of the um, kind of visitor parking. Yep, those two. And then looking to cover as much of the south side staff parking as possible. But, you know, we're still in design development. We're working with the engineers to figure out exactly how much, you know, PV square footage we need. So we're still trying to right size and right locate those. Excellent. That's it. All right. Great. Thank you, Mike. Um, I think that, you know, it's, it's a nice work, a nice design work. Um, I'm a little, uh, I'm not clear, like, who's, who's going to do the secret review on this? It's a town project. It's, I know, but is the town board going to do the environmental quality review? Town is the lead agency for the project. Uh, planning board would, or excuse me, planning department would provide the technical support for that review. Okay, so there's there'll be a, a secret process that will include the subdivision and the project, but it hasn't begun yet. No, sir. We're yeah. we're still in the laying things out phase. Okay. So I think it would, it would be important to to get to that where um, all of the normal uh, items that get reviewed uh, could be incorporated. Uh, for example, we have a lot of different facilities in the town now. Uh, we have another one on tonight. Project Most is proposing uh, daycare camp, another semi-public facility. <laughs> Um, I, I guess I'm, this is really a question. We have the Y, uh, we have a very active trails society and trail system. We have Duck Creek that has, these are all pretty much all municipal uh, buildings. We have a lot of activities in Ashwell Hall and churches, synagogues, schools, um, libraries, Guild Hall. And I guess my question at the Montauk Rec Center, my question is, what sort of work have you done about the existing use of the existing facility? The capacity you're building in here, how do they compare? Are you projecting a certain increase need and capacity? Have you looked at how this facility might be coordinated with all these other activities that are currently going on in the town. 
So I'll I'll offer you a point of view. Yeah, um, absolutely from a planning point of view. So I'll I have oh. a facility that doesn't get used as much as we would like it to be used. And one way that that could happen is if it was more of a shared facility. I don't know what a senior means. I don't know who can use this facility. You have to be 55 and over. Do you have to be 65 and over? 60. So you have to be 60 or you, you can't go there. I think not, not for our programs, no. Yeah, so that, that might be that might not be the way to maximize the use of the facility. Um, all those questions, those sort of planning comprehensive questions, I hope that you're going to get to that in the secret process and that the public will have an opportunity to, to comment. I, absolutely. So I, I want to communicate a couple of things, and then I'll ask the design team to uh, share your guidance as well. Um, I believe the short answer to your question is, yes, we've begun in earnest asking and answering and diving deep on many of the questions that you posed. And I think the process continues from here, both through the secret process and through the design. So uh, in terms of uh, what's been done so far, the, this really began with a bunch of listening. And the, the listening got started by sitting with the staff and the users of the current facility and saying, what do you do now? What are the uh, staffing space uh, the storage needs, you know, everything that you could think of for how, how do we conduct these programs? What enables these programs? To what extent are these programs necessary? How will these programs change if they find a new home? And there was a basic question that got asked, are we currently providing the level of service that we think the community needs and deserves? And broadly, the answer to that question was no. And the, re the reason for that answer was we're space and resource constrained. So the new facility is larger than the old facility. Uh, worth noting that the current facility and the new facility would both propose to be multifunctional, not only in terms of how uh, the seniors in the community would use it, but also uh, we have, for example, multiple 12 te uh, step programs that use the current facility and are invited to, and we anticipate uh, using the new it's, facility. It's a good example of shared use. I exactly. And so we're, we're actively identifying and seeking those opportunities to uh, have something serve, you know, a greater good as well. Um, but beyond the, the interviews with the staff and the current users, there was a series of open charrettes and design processes, both here in this room at Town Hall, but also at the current senior center. So, you know, go where people are and ask them what they need there. Um, so we and the design team uh, in general put in the time to ask not only what are we doing and where does it go from here, but also, what do people want? We ask them to sort of close their eyes and dream a little bit. Uh, if you could have something other than what is being presented to you now, what would that be? And no surprise, we had all kinds of answers, right? I mean, there, there were people who wanted things that were just simply well beyond anything that was ever going to be contemplated here, you know, hot air ballooning and swimming pools and, you know, all kinds of stuff. And so we, we try to get it back down into an appropriate size box and then do actually some of the survey work that you talked about, about what are the other facilities within town? Are there uh, opportunities to partner? One of the things that I think was very appealing about this particular site and opportunity is its central location within the town. So, you know, if you mention uh, the Montauk Playhouse, for example, I think there's a compelling case to be made for that facility and the services that it is contemplating providing when it uh, gets itself across the finish line. But of course, that will forever be in Montauk and will therefore likely have a geographic constraint in terms of services and audience. I think you can make a similar observation about some of the either outdoor facilities that have been brought online recently within the town, the new ball fields over on uh, Stephen Hans Path, for example. But even to a certain extent, uh, the joint relationship between the village and the town and the YMCA where that facility because of its geography has you know certain limitations and constraints and I think you know we were very clear in assessing the survey work that came out of these interviews and these charrette processes that we didn't want to create a gym we didn't want to create a workout facility uh, we got very clear feedback that said you know please don't show us a room full of treadmills instead what people were interested in was um, a set of learning and social 
and interaction opportunities that were built around programming, food, lectures, opportunities to engage both, you know, physically, yes, but also intellectually and to continue a learning journey. I'm, I'm assuming you're saying these things are not currently available. That's, I think that's my concern is that a lot of seniors, as you define them, use the dog park, go to Guild Hall, go to Sag Harbor, uh, take classes at Stony Brook South. So there's, you know, it, we all like to dream about the ideal facility, but I think on the other side, you have the, if I read it correctly, is this a $70 million project? Did you say seven zero? Yeah. No, I think you're seven. over. Yeah, I think you're seven. over by a factor of about uh, two point five or three to one. So, uh, you know, we, we're What's ambitious, that? but not quite that ambitious. Yeah. What's the rough number at this I, point? I I will ask uh, either Ronnie or Carol to twenty eight million dollars. Yeah. Twenty eight million dollars. So, that's a big expense for the people of East Hampton, and I think they deserve to have a a very you know you are thinking it through. But I think they that it, we should be sure that it does not duplicate existing programs that are popular, because otherwise you're you're competing with existing successful programs, and why why fix it if it ain't broke? Well, I would argue it is broke. When's the last time you were at the senior center? Well, 10 years ago. Yeah. Well, it, it hasn't, it hasn't gotten much but a coat of paint. And so I, I let's go have a cup of coffee at the senior center. I, I think it, despite the amazing work they do, we have to acknowledge that that hundred year old facility is broke. I, I think that for our purposes and for the purposes yeah. of what's being presented tonight, though, you know, it's being brought to the planning board for planning board expertise, not for the policy question of whether the project should go forward. I, I don't know that that's within our purview. And it sounds to me like, your, you know, your comments are more geared towards, towards that issue. I, I'd be interested no, in knowing no, whether you're right. I, I, well, but, that's not right. No? I'm saying that in, in our normal review, the town board has decided as they did with the health facility that they are going to be the lead agency mm -hmm. and we're I don't want to say rubber stamp. No, we're certainly not. In fact, the point of us we're not. We stamp. haven't been involved oh, in this until now. Sam, yeah, can I oh, finish? Please, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. And I'm not saying that it shouldn't go forward at all. And I'm not saying that that existing facility is an embarrassment. It is. What I'm saying is that the process would benefit by, I think, going through our normal processes. Now, it's not going to do that. So I'm, I'm trying to raise some of the concerns that I would bring up if it came to us for review. That's all. Uh, so typically, what we talk about is uh, are things like impact on traffic, impact on the community, impact on uh, the water, impact on the physical environment. Well, and, need and, need well, is yeah, one okay, of the key things in Seabrook. Uh, you know, uh, we did it with the well, no, Wayne Scott. Yeah, no, no, I understand. It's, it there's is something that's analysis required, and, that's, and I understand that's behind yeah. asking about whether there's going to be a secret review because that's yeah. going to be one of the areas presumably would be scoped in, and that would yeah. be something that we would cover. But for the purposes of the town board and the and the architects getting our input at this early stage because you know the, 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 no spade has gone in the ground yet. No, but it's been <laughs> but, worked on for right, but, but couple of years at least. The, the idea is that if it's coming to the planning board, maybe we should focus on planning stuff like. Traffic, I think right, I am. Environment. I don't okay. know if you're you're scolding me. No, I'm not scolding you. No, I'm, no, no, not at all. What I'm getting at is you're. You, you have you have in in the five years that I've worked with you on here, you've been incredibly perceptive on issues involving <laughs> traffic impact, environmental impact, yeah. water impact, all that, and I'd love to hear that. Well, <laughs> I'd uh, love to hear you say. You know, if you've got no, I a think they're doing the traffic good, is wrong or something. I think they're doing a good job with the design. My question is, has it been um, looked at, the, the overlap or duplication? Has it been su sufficiently looked at and have the existing things that are going on here, are they sufficiently integrated I, into this? It's, uh, Member Parsons, I... 
I will do what I should have done five minutes ago, which is um, cede it to the, the folks who uh, have gone through the charrette process. So Ronnie, if I could ask you to share some of your guidance here, please. Yes, right from the beginning, we uh, looked at all of those competing programs and it, it was very much, we're not having a gymnasium. We're having lightweight health and wellness. We looked at, um, uh, once again, shared programs. So in our community outreach, I think that we tried to address all of those functions and um, and we've provided uh, different levels. Once again, it's, it's centered on people over the age of 60, but that's not exclusive either. And I think Diane um, has even been looking at at other programs that other senior centers have been able to offer. And so we've brought in all this mix, the community and the, the, ta the center as it is now. So we feel pretty confident. I think that you, you, uh, you did a great job with the charrettes, but I don't think that necessarily represents the entire community. And I think during the secret process, if you lay out your analysis of the need and how it's not overlapping, you'll give a, a wider group of people in the town, both 60 and over and, and under 60, an opportunity to express their thoughts about integration and overlap. And so I, I think the goal that you uh, aspire to is one that we share. And I'll, I'll just observe for the board that uh, there have been at least two, if not three, presentations at work sessions before the town board. Uh, we're now before you for the first time, which we describe as probably the first of three. Mm -hmm. um, and the, in, that's all in addition to the, the public design charrette process. So um, I, I would hope that, you know, between all of those opportunities, I, I think, you know, a, a quick count of those is we're rapidly approaching double digit opportunities that are open to any member of the public to come in and share their uh, their thinking or their concerns for us. Um, and we welcome that, right? There, there's no attempt to do anything other than to take the good guidance a, as you're urging us to do. So uh, if there's a recommendation for a, a separate either process or uh, opportunity for us to create, I, I think we'd be wide open to that. Could, could you, my last question is, what is the existing use of the existing facility? How many people use it? How many people did you design this one for? That was, a very that was, that was a question I had. Okay. <laughs> well, it would depend on what program you're talking about. You know? So could I ask you to come up just because I think the microphone and the... Yeah, sure. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Public speaking. <laughs> and you let us have your name and spell it, you know. Sure. My name is Diane Patrizio, D-I-A-N-E, P-A-T-R-I-Z-I-O. Um, we have various different programs going on. You know, our nutrition program. Um, you know, I, I have to preface this by saying, you know, pre-COVID and coming back from COVID is, is still a process we're, we're going through. You know, it hit our population pretty seriously. So our numbers before, I mean, daily we would have 80 people having lunch. We're getting, we're getting closer to that. But we would have problems because we could not fit people in the parking lot. Staff couldn't fit in the parking lot. So we would we park over at the church and or we did and walk over. Um, when you come into our building, you walk right into the lunchroom. Some people don't want to participate in lunch. They would rather participate in wellness. And as far as partnering, we partner with the YMCA. They teach some of our classes, some of their teachers. Um, we transport people to the YMCA if they need it. Uh, we work with, we've had to work with Ashwag Hall uh, for some of our wellness classes because we can't fit them in the building. Um, we're, we're trying to, uh, increase clubs, you know, there, there's so many things we want to do, but we can't because we don't have the room. Do you use, do you currently use buses? Uh, yes, we have a transportation program. Out? And right. would that be the case in this yes. as well? Yes. And they would follow I, the same path as the yeah, drop, drop clients follow. off in the front, which would be preferable, mm -hmm. and then, you know, park in the back. Okay. So, so they wouldn't go to that around back part where the food 
delivery. Yes, yeah, so I, I oh, believe that's where we plan on the buses parking, correct? Parking, but not Picking dropping and dropping off. But not dropping off. off. Right. What would you say is the maximum number of, of users that you'd have at any given moment? That we have now? Well, no, that you anticipate in this. In the perfect world. I I don't know. I would think if if our uh, you know with we're having a lobby now, mm -hmm. which we sort of see uh, as Starbucks, you know, where you won't have to go hang out at Starbucks. You can hang out at the center. Starbucks probably won't like that. Uh, <laughs> a generic coffee. Set. Okay, I, I, I mean a coffee. Uh, yeah, a cafe. Yeah. Um, but that that's new. You know, a gathering place. So I think that that can bring in easily. You know, thirty additional people a day that we don't use because people would love a place to talk. Mm -hmm. The wellness programs. Um, I, our class is 20, 25 people, you know, we're, we're going to have an arts and crafts room, a media room, you know, where we're looking to hire an, a, a senior citizen club leader. So that's, we do, we do envision that we need some new people to, uh, you know, to bring some new programs there but we are we're already we already have them we just don't have the room so that's why we're using ashwag hall you know for the wellness how we much, i'm sorry no, how much staff do you anticipate well um right now we have well okay we're i need to hire people you know if anyone would like to drive a bus i really need bus drivers but um our staff uh, approximately 25 to 30 on site on site i mean the bus drivers will be out you know we have homemakers that go to homes but most of the staff would would be on site and parking on that that strip in, in the back the Randy. Yeah, you know. Yeah, that, no, that's pretty much it. I, so it sounds like you're you're down below eighty now with the meals. Well, uh, but yeah, but things have COVID. changed because what has happened is we used to just serve on site, but now we do grab and go because some people don't want to come to the site, so they come to the site to pick up five frozen meals a week. And yeah. that's a whole new thing we're doing. I think that's terrific that you do that. And I also hear great stuff about your advisors and your transportation. Mm -hmm. I guess the, the, the question is really goes to what capacity did the designers design to and how does that compare to your existing use? That's I, really I, yeah, I, I really think we we went through all the numbers of people that attend all the programs. Um, you know, when we have an, a special activity, we easily would bring in over 100 people. You know, the population is aging. Um, I, I, I think aging is different than it used to be. You know, we're, we're working longer, so uh, we might need to do activities in the evening you know, perhaps in the afternoon, maybe even transport later in the day. Like, I, I think there is so much opportunity for the 60 and over population, which is a very active population. But still, sometimes, you know, if you want to take an exercise class and you're of a certain age, Going to a class where most people are 20 or 25, you feel a little out of place, you know? So to have a place where you feel comfortable taking a yoga class or trying something new because you're not the oldest person in the room, which is something I've started to notice. I don't really know how that happened, but it, it, it it's something you think about. And I just... We've we've looked into studies on how the population is aging, and we're really aging. You know, out here, it's what about senior daycare? Well, that was not a. We had an adult daycare program, mm -hmm. and our numbers had been consistently low for the last ten years. Mm -hmm. And uh, COVID has also 
diminished it. But also there's the Medicaid program where, you know, you can have home care at your home. And, and here's the thing, the people coming to lunch are, are people range from 60 to easily 95 to 100. So people are just more active, healthier. And that's what we see. Our, our goal is to keep people active and healthier and in their homes. And that's what we think we can do by providing socialization, proper nutrition, um, you know, um, educational opportunities. I, I, I'm really excited about how we can change what people think a senior center is. So many people don't come because they're like, well, I'm, you know, they might not be interested in lunch, but maybe they'd be interested in a club that we don't have at this time because we don't have room. Some seniors like to be around children too. I mean, I don't know. You know more than about yeah, that. Many than don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sharing that. And, that. and you know, that's why I feel very comfortable addressing all this because we really did examine everything. We've been working on this a long time and uh, all we the, this was open to everyone. And you can Believe it, believe me when I say people are very vocal as far as what they want. So, right, we had charts where people could write whatever they wanted. Um, it, it was a really great process. It's still a small sample of the entire community. I'd like to just go back to some planning uh, issues here. Can you draw back? The, the okay, so am I yeah, 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 this yeah. is this is going to be just which, which slide, Mr. Just so that I see Abraham's path and the access oh, yeah. onto the you local road network, if you have anything like that. Yeah. Because I'll, I'll tell you, I, I'm a little concerned that you've got one two lane, is it two lane or one lane, uh, going and coming into the facility. If you have 100 people at, I don't know, some program in the evening or in the day, whatever it might be, that you might have a backup of traffic that might, you know, impact the local road network negatively or that might back up into the facility. I'm wondering, and again, I don't know what the land, what, what, what land the town purchased and didn't, but maybe you can have a, a, a separate driveway for staff, possibly, to get in and out of the uh, part of the place where they're going to be parking. I'm just looking for some way that might lighten the traffic load, both on the facility and in the neighboring area for those occasions. And I know you don't know what they're going to be just yet. That's that's a function of your programming. But that, from a planning perspective, that's something that gives me a little bit of concern. And again, it's but it's a concern that's not informed by anything programmatic. If I if I knew something, and I'm not suggesting you should know at this point, then I might not even think this. But it's just that that's a bit of a, a something I'm you know concerned about. Environmental issues such as the water. Uh, I mean, it's a brand new facility, and I'm sure it's going to be state of the art. So that doesn't concern me. Uh, it's I, I know precisely where this is, and I don't see it as a as a negative impact on the physical environment. You're, you're, you're working out of a tabla rasa, as it were. So as far as I, I can tell, those sorts of things, from a planning perspective, I think you're on the right track, and I think it's all, it's all for the good. The only, you know, planning thing that, uh, that, to me, I am concerned about, and that may not be a permanent concern, but just 30,000 feet first time out, is just that. Just the one thing about, about traffic in and traffic out. Also, considering that you're going to have bus traffic coming and going, you're going to have truck traffic uh, for food deliveries coming and going. I don't know. So that, that's that's the only thing that I'm, you know, uh, looking at in terms of planning. I agree with the other members, too. If the, the designers and the town board understand, we have a we have a private applicant for a semi public facility later tonight. And they're going to be asked to meet the coverage and the total coverage requirements. So I just want you to be aware that there's a mixed message there. If it's our project, we don't have to meet the standard. But if it's your project, you have to meet it. 
How do we explain that? Yeah, <laughs> let's, let, let's, we, we do have another matter on. We also have those two um, matters that are um, uh, the GSL and the Three Mile Harbor, which um, I'm wondering whether we should push those uh, to the end or do them. But right now they're scheduled to be at the end after Project Most. There are a lot of people here for most. So they don't have for most. So I'm afraid to those folks who are here on those two, we're going to have to put them, keep them at the end. Uh, I think, uh, so I'm afraid that that's what it's going to have to be. One final question. Yeah, go ahead. Is there a, a plan to maintain any programming at the old facility or maintain the building at all? Or do we, just I'm just curious. Yeah. No. 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 Okay. Uh, All right. Yeah. There's the answer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just two. Uh, uh, if you want to do I, a conclusion, a well, I uh, very mercifully, briefly. Um, I, I, I want to. Um, I, I want to acknowledge that Member Parsons is correct that, you know, need is, of course, uh, something that is need and community benefit, right? Let's name both of those things are items that are uh, called out in SECRA as needing to be explored fully and uh, weighed relative to other alternatives, right? So I, I believe firmly that demographics is destiny. And I just want to share with you, you know, a, a couple of demographic numbers uh, from uh, the not just the most recent census in 2020, but uh, the annual update that comes out after that. Our population in East Hampton Town was documented to grow by uh, basically from uh, 14,000 on an annual basis to, or a year round basis rather, to 21,000. Uh, so, you know, essentially a 50% jump, uh, you know, over a, a 10 year period, right? Um, the trend is obvious and uh, inevitable at this point. Um, the other demographic trend, and we think that that's a low number, you know, the, for a whole host of reasons, we think that the actual year round population of this community is far larger. So I think as we're making planning decisions about where do we go from here, not just responding to what current need is, but trying to anticipate, you know, what future need is, I think we have to anticipate growth in raw numbers of population. What will that population actually be composed of? We in East Hampton Town have uh, the oldest population in New York State. We're older on average than any other community on Long Island or elsewhere in Suffolk County. We're older than the national average. Our average age in East Hampton Town is 48 years old, and it's going up on an annual basis, right? So if we're actually planning, I would argue that, you know, the population is getting bigger, it's getting older, and the number of people who will need services will continue to grow over time. I think the question that we should be asking as a community is, what will our response to that be? And will we wait until the need is already here, or will we anticipate it? Thanks. Okay, um, we're going to wrap up on this and uh, move on to the uh, other matters on our uh, agenda. Thank you for the uh, to the architecture firm and uh, other uh, folks working with them for being here. And uh, thank you, Jeremy, for being here and Kathy. And thank you very much. Uh, we hope that we were helpful in some way. Okay, now we're going to move on, uh, and again, to the folks who are here for the GSL and Three Mile Harbor. We're going to put those, we got to keep them at the end, I'm afraid, because we have so many folks here who are here on Project Most, and, you know, we want to be able to let them get in and get out. So, um, all right, uh, the applicant uh, is uh, applicant's representative here. It's, sorry. Okay. Um, we have uh, Tina, you're going to be uh, presenting for the planning department, and yes. Ian, this is your uh, application. So, well, not your application, you're here for the board. This, we, sh we share it together. Yep. Yes. Okay. So, I'm just going to uh, bring up the aerial image to show where the uh, facility is located. So this is uh, Three Mile Harbor Road, Jackson Street, right to the south, Springs Fireplace is here. Um, before I begin, this is my first review as the planner uh, reviewing this project. 
I'm not a decision maker on this project, but I do want to disclose that I do have a son that utilizes the project most after school care at one of the local schools. Uh, I do not believe this will impact my ability to be fair and impartial. I just wanted to let the board and the community know that that's the case. You know, my role is to provide code analysis to the board. I'm not a decision maker. I'll emphasize that. This is a site plan application that has been before the board a few times before. The application is to demolish an existing structure and locate an existing two-story structure to the site of um, Project Most and Neighborhood House to serve as the new location for Project Most. This qualifies as a semi-public facility um, per the town code. The building will have a gross floor of approximately 7,600 square feet, um, a second floor with, uh, so the first floor, is, I'm sorry, the first floor is 5,213 square feet and the second floor is 2,400 square feet. There's also a basement. The subject parcel is about 2.4 acres in size and is zoned acres. The uh, project was last reviewed on February 1st. And the planning board did issue several comments um, during the discussion. So where those all were made, uh, they're addressed throughout the memo. Uh, regarding just to refresh uh, folks' memory, um, in the last submission, the applicant submitted a narrative regarding the operational parameters for the facility. I just reproduced that in the memo, so it's fresh in everybody's mind. Um, the weekday operates um, non-summer between 9 and 8 p.m. And on Saturdays, there are programs for around 9 to 4 with 20 children. Uh, the camp and learning programs during the summer are anticipated to have 75 children. And there's a daycare program with a maximum attendance of 40 children and 15 employees. There's also a commercial kitchen. So that narrative has not changed since the last. I just wanted to refresh the memory. Since the last site plan review, there have, uh, have been several revisions to the site plan. So I am going to switch to that now and talk through those. Second. So since the last round, the applicant has reported that they uh, addressed fire marshal comments. We're still waiting on his review. Um, that will be forthcoming. The building location uh, has been moved back approximately 35 feet of, um, away from the front yard. And the applicant reported that was to preserve the existing trees. Um, note that principal and accessory setbacks are doubled for a semi-public facility in a residential zone such as this one, and the new configuration is still meeting those uh, double setbacks. The paved parking on site is proposed to be reduced um, to 19 spaces from the previous 25 with 18 grass paver overflow. The parking orientation now is, um, this is actually north on the side of the diagram, this is kind of a little switched. So it's kind of adjacent, uh, parallel to the northern border, and then the grass paver parking is in the rear of the lot. Uh, at the last review, the planning board requested that truck parking be provided on site. The applicant responded by providing a van parking space um, in this location, which we can discuss later. I'm not sure that met um, the intent. And the um, the ingress and egress of the site has been modified. So at this point, the proposed ingress to the site is on the northern side of the lot adjacent to um, Neighborhood Road. And the southern um, exit would be the entrance. So it kind of be a one-way flow of traffic through the uh, frontage of the facility on Three Mile Harbor Road. The curb cuts have also been expanded to 20 foot in width and the location of the proposed sculpture to be located on the site has been added to the plan, although I don't saw on this one. Um, so moving through the issues. Regarding CICRA, this is an unlisted action uh, according to the regulations and the town code. At the planning board meeting on February 1st, the board agreed to be lead agency. And looking at the EAF, we do think it needs to be updated. There were a few form fields that were blank, and we want to make sure that it includes all the appropriate approvals that are listed here um, and all the latest information since the project has changed since the initial form was prepared. 
Um, as referenced a little bit in the um, introduction, this is a required special permit for a summary uh, public facility. Because they are increasing the gross floor area by uh, more than 50%, the substantial expansion applies. So a new special permit is needed. In order to approve that special permit, um, the criteria in 25550, the semi public facility special permit standards must be met. And I list those below and talk about where their compliance is. And then the general standards for special permits also apply to in 250, 2540, which um, has been discussed in, in previous uh, discussions. Uh, the first special permit criteria that applies is that the principal setbacks need to be doubled, and those are met. The um, site plans included the building envelopes, the principal building envelopes, and the accessory building envelopes, and they are largely being met. The uh, criteria two and three don't apply. The criteria four is regarding building coverage, and that is being met, but they are just under the um, total lot coverage that is allotted for a facility of this size. Regarding parking and circulation, this was an area that was discussed um, in some detail at the last review. One of the issues is there's no defined parking requirement, and so there is discretion of the planning board to determine the appropriate number of spaces. Since the last review, there's been a reduction in the spaces proposed from 25 to 19. The applicant indicated this was due to further analysis, but didn't um, explain what that analysis was. So. We'd like them to present that so we can understand whether or not the planning board agrees that the appropriate amount of parking is here for the uses on the site. The primary means of bringing children to the site will be from passenger cars, dropping them off um, in front of the building. So the proposed flow is to have an entrance only curb cut, an exit only curb cut. We understand based on the applicant submission that um, contemporaneous with this submission, they have submitted to the Suffolk County Department of Public Works, which is appropriate three mile Harbor Road is a county road in this location. Um, we think this is a fine configuration, but without the comments of the Suffolk County Department of Public Works, we don't know whether or not it's, it's going to be feasible. So I think it's very important for the applicant to provide the input to the planning board and whether or not such a county is accepting of this. Um, they may not want two curb cuts so close together on one of their roads. And there is the very, very close proximity of neighborhood house road that I'm sure they'll consider in their review. And, and we've, all, we've also made comments about wanting to make sure that there's no conflict between the entrance and that adjacent roadway. The other question about parking that we had is, um, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Um, the van parking space does not meet uh, the truck parking requirements in the code, so or it doesn't seem to. So we just uh, would like some a little more detail. The plan really needs to make sure that there is an adequate truck parking space. I mean, I think the original comment was that it should be near the kitchen to facilitate deliveries um, to, in a way that's as non-intrusive intrusive as possible. Regarding traffic, at the last planning board meeting, the board requested the applicant prepare a traffic study to analyze the impact of the proposed facility, and that has been submitted. We had several comments on that. I'll try to go through them quickly. The first issue was that one of the things we asked the applicant to focus on during the last review was potential conflicts with neighborhood road, which is literally very like, right next to the um, existing site entrance. It is an existing site entrance, so this is an existing condition. Um, the traffic study touched on that, but not in any great detail. So we want to make sure that the studies revised to add assessment of potential conflicts for vehicles entering the site with this road and make sure that the configuration proposed is, is safe and will function efficiently from a traffic perspective. The next uh, item that was questioned in our review was the way trips were characterized. The traffic study indicated that they believed most of the trips would be passed by trips, meaning that they're already on the road and they're just kind of stopping on their way somewhere else. I, that wasn't really supported. I don't, I don't know if the applicant has other information that would make it be more logical to include, but we think that that should be removed from the study if it can't be supported with further analysis and, and supporting statements. 
Um, the study purpose and methodology on page two and another location in the report that talks about roadway conditions omitted discussions of the closest roadways. So those do need to be accurately described. You know, it's important, obviously, the closest roadways to the site get accurately described in the report. Another area of improvement for the study could be trip generation. The trip generation estimates were produced based on information that were provided from the existing facility. Um, often in traffic studies, the um, ITE manual is used. And, and that's a helpful resource. It's uh, kind of an industry standard for preparing traffic studies. Even if the applicant thinks it's not appropriate to use IT, it'd be good to know what the appropriate land use codes in IT have traffic generation for a facility of this nature in order to provide us all with the frame of reference that the projections uh, utilized for the study are conservative and kind of uh, acceptable from that industry-wide purview. Um, and then we had some other questions about the details of how trips were considered to enter and leaving the site. Um, Regarding queuing, this is something that the board discussed during the last uh, meeting. And I do think this needs a little bit more of further discussion and assurance that there will be no impact to queued vehicles um, to Three Mile Harbor Road. Um, the queuing analysis submitted by the applicant, which I'll, I'll scroll to, um, indicated that there's 11, uh, space for 11 vehicles. Uh, to queue on the site, and there's two-way traffic. Let me just find it. Oh, I'm not. Sorry. Please. Folks, folks, please keep it down. Excuse me, Mr. Chair, but we ask the presenter to move a little closer to the mic. We have a little trouble. That's what we're discussing. Oh, I'm so she sorry. Like, she'll bring the mic closer to herself. Ask us. <laughs> And I, I sit here, I feel like I'm screaming. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Good now? A little better. Yeah. Watch this. Hello. <laughs> there you go. I'm very sorry about that. So here's the queuing analysis that the applicant submitted to demonstrate that there's uh, adequate space for 11 cars to queue on site, as well as um, adequate space for cars to kind of pass each other should the need arise. Um, I, I do think that we'd like to be sure that the queuing analysis considered atypical operations, like if there's a vehicle that's stopped for longer than they should be, as we all know, um, with young children, especially day carriage children, maybe difficult to get children in and out of the cars efficiently, like to make sure that those types of conditions were accounted for in the queuing analysis. And if alternate mitigation measures to ensure queuing will not occur on Three Mile Harbor could be explored, such as visitor parking in the frontage of the site. So if people know they have um, slower children, they can have an opportunity to pull over and not, um, and not cause a traffic backup. This is a busy road. It is a road with 40 mile per hour cars going by. Um, we really can't have cars skewed on the, on the side there. I don't think there's space. And, and finally, on the traffic study, often traffic studies compare existing conditions with proposed conditions. There wasn't any information on the precise uh, traffic operations currently occurring. That would be helpful information to include. Um, and then the increment is really what, what's analyzed for the impact assessment. And then finally, there's the subject of the bus stop, which we've talked about before. I'm sure that they'll talk to Suffolk County DPW as promised. Regarding the caretaker apartment, this was an issue that was discussed at the last meeting. Um, the planning department confirmed with the building inspector that the use could continue without a variance. So that has been settled in the email correspondence confirming that's attached to the memo. Regarding the existing building removal, the planning board asked last uh, meeting for more information on the operations associated with taking that building down and removing it was provided. The applicant provided a narrative um, that went through the kind of step-by-step for that process, I think that information is sufficient. The one thing that I wanted to flag was that the um, protocol included testing for asbestos. We should just make sure that any asbestos-containing materials, if found, are you know appropriately handled and disposed of in accordance with applicable regulations. That might change some of what the applicant said, but not to a great degree. But that, that is an important thing that needs to be conducted properly. Regarding the sanitary plan, um, as shown, it's currently compliant with town standards. The Suffolk County Department of Health Services is really the authority on that system, and the applicant should explain if they have 
applied to that agency and what the um, timeline is with them. Regarding landscaping and oh, yeah, town uh, for drainage, we've sent this to the town engineer for um, the town engineer's review. So we'll expect uh, detailed technical comments on that. For landscaping and screening, um, the a concept plan was provided, and uh, you know it's, there's a lovely concept laid out. I think one of the most important things that the board had said at the last meeting was that we want to make sure that the, the landscaping provides adequate screening for the adjacent residential community. Um, so quantities and heights were not, this is a concept plan, so those were not provided. So granted the board's um, okay with the concept and the applicant can support the adequacy of the screening and buffering provided, um, I think it can move forward in, in this configuration. Six foot fencing is shown around the perimeter of the property um, to a great extent. It's hard to see at this scale, but on all sides except the property frontage with Three Mile Harbor Road. Um, and ARB is going to, uh, you know, be reviewing that fence. The type of fencing wasn't specified, so that should be um, specified. The lighting plan is acceptable generally, except that the sign in front of the facility is supposed to be lighted. ARB, I'm sure, will be reviewing that element of the overall plan. ARB um, comments are appropriate for this facility at this time. This is a kind of unique situation, so we did suggest that the applicant submit to ARB, even though the planning board hasn't approved the project yet, just to get their initial feedback regarding the overall mass and scale of what's, what's happening here. Um, so in conclusion, uh, the application remains incomplete for specific items, including uh, com confirmation of the site, parking adequacy, traffic study details and updates, and the detailed landscaping plan. Really important overall is the proposed circulation plan and the second curb cut to Three Mile Harbor Road. Um, because Suffolk County DPW has not indicated whether or not they're um, approving of this yet, we recommend that the planning board continue to kind of consider the site layout, whether or not acceptable, but I don't know how much further we can go with the review of the application until we have that very critical piece of um, approval from Suffolk County DPW on the curb cut. That concludes my comments. Thanks very much for that very thorough report on this very uh, multifaceted application. Ms. Burke. Good evening, Chairman, members of the board. I'm Tara Burke from Lighthouse Land Planning here on behalf of Project Most. Uh, before you is our second submission for a site plan special permit approval for the new and upgraded facility for Project Most after school, summer, and daycare facilities. Uh, since our last review, the site plan layout has changed uh, considerably as noted. We took your comments from the last review and we believe we've addressed a majority of those comments and have in turn created a much nicer layout uh, for both the children using Project Most facility and we believe for the community at large. Um, as noted in Tina's memo, the building was shifted back to 35 feet to preserve the existing trees and also in response to prior planning board comments and create a more residential feel for the property. Uh, we've created the one-way entrances as we discussed uh, at the last meeting and exits for access to create a fluid drop-off and parking area. And we believe it has better overall circulation on site. Um, and another big change is that we've reduced and shifted the parking um, the parking main lot, which was previously right behind the building, uh, we've created this longer, narrower parking area concentrated the north side, uh, and then the smaller parking area on the south, uh, where that van loading space is, which is near the kitchen facilities. Um, one of the main benefits of this layout is the functionality and the use of the property behind the building for the children. Um, when we further analyzed it, when we got into creating the, the in and out, we thought about how the parking lot was previously right behind the building, which meant when the children were leaving the facility, they would potentially have to cross the parking lot to get to the playing fields. Um, and we really wanted to create this open, expansive space in the back where the kids could go out, explore these beautiful gardens, which we'll talk about more. Um, and have an overall open and you know safe educational experience back there. Uh, so we believe that the layout creates a better circulation, better screening from the road and the neighboring properties, and better use of the grounds. And overall, it complies with the special permit standards uh, in the town code. 
Um, I'd like to touch on some of the points in the planner's memo and then just have a couple of the design professionals come up to address uh, specific points, mainly the traffic study and the landscaping plan. Um, so going through the memo, uh, for CICRA, we have no problem updating the EAF. Uh, we'll work with Tina on anything we have questions on with the mapper uh, printout, but that's no problem whatsoever. Uh, the substantial expansion and special permit criteria, I think she laid it out really well. Um, we do comply with all of those special permit standards, um, we believe at least. Uh, the parking and circulation, um, with respect to the reduction in the parking spaces and the planner's request for more information pertaining to this analysis, um, I want to offer some more detail on how we arrived at our current figures of 37 total spaces, which is 19 paved and 18 overflow. Um, we can submit this in writing as well uh, for the record. Uh, there are three main components to project most usage of the facility, which is the daycare, the after school programs, and the summer camp. Our initial memo to the board noted the number of kids and a maximum of 15 employees on site. All numbers noted are the highest possible based on state requirements for staffing with the various usages. Um, we don't anticipate this level of usage, however, uh, but we're still trying to prepare for the highest usage. Um, there are several factors as to why we decided we needed less paving. All had to do with the ways and the times that the property is used. Um, not all the children and employees are uh, accessing the facility at the same time. So for example, with respect to the daycare, um, the drop-off and pickup is not at the same time. Uh, parents drop off and pick up at varied times throughout the day. Some drop at 7 a.m., some drop at 9. Same with the pickup. Some pick up at 3, some pick up at 5. So there's not like a mass influx and uh, outflow of daycare at once. Um, and the overwhelming majority of the kids will be met in that drop-off area. Uh, the intention is for the caretakers to greet the parents and walk the kids or carry the younger ones in after saying goodbye to their parents. Um, the, um, if there is a possible of a maximum employees on site, there'll still be nine spaces plus the overload park floor parking for parents. Um, and again, the drop off and pick up times will be varied with the needs. Um, with the after school programs, uh, a lot of those daycare employees then transition into the after school care. Um, and the vast majority of the after school programs are still functioning at the schools. Um, that is not intending to change. There'll be some limited programs here after school for things like tutoring, the cooking classes, um, gardening classes. And some of those programs will be after the daycare closes and others will have limited attendance and be very specific for older kids where they're not gonna need anyone to park to drop them off. Um, and then finally, for the summer camp, uh, the regulations on staffing needs for summer camps is less than daycare facilities. Uh, so we actually need less employees for the same number of kids at a, day, at a summer camp um, in compared to daycare. Uh, and again, the drop-off and pickup times vary. A lot of the counselors at the camp are 14, 15-year-olds who are getting dropped off out front and picked back up. Um, so just based on a, a real thorough analysis of the use, we realized that we really didn't need the 25 parking spaces and that the 19 would, would be more than ample and affords us the ability to comply with the coverage calculations and also create this open, expensive space in the back for the kids to play in. Um, we really put a lot of thought into this revised layout. And then based on past practice and the usage of Project Most, um, we, anticipate, we really anticipate that 37 spaces should be ample. Um, and again, I'm happy to put that in writing. Um, with regards to the DPW, which I think uh, Tina pointed out was kind of a, a crucial element, which I agree, um, we haven't submitted yet. Uh, we plan on submitting after this meeting. Since we changed the layout pretty significantly and you hadn't seen it prior, um, it didn't make sense to submit to them yet. It would only confuse the process at the county level. So uh, we are you know, full steam ahead after this meeting because um, we recognize that's critical. Uh, the truck loading space, um, we actually did initially have it in the front and it does fit where the drop off area is, but we decided to add the van loading space on the side because um, we really don't anticipate large truck deliveries here. It would be van to the kitchen area. Um, we're happy to put the dimensions for that. We understand that there might be the code requirement for the truck loading space, even though we don't need it. And if that's the case, we can um, put it where the drop-off area is. We know that it does meet the dimensional regulations and um, 
we coordinate those deliveries for when there were no kids at the facility. Um, with respect to the traffic study, I'm really not going to go into much detail. That's not my purview. Um, I will ask Osmond Berry from Nelson Pope to come up and discuss that. Um, but we are confident that we can address any concerns. Uh, all the traffic counts are based on worst case scenarios. Um, things like the pass by trips, the the traffic study wasn't based on that. That the traffic study was based on actual numbers. We were just noting that it actually won't be that because a lot of people are already on their way to work. Um, so, but we're happy to refine all of that information, um, make it a little bit more clear so there's a better understanding of it. Um, as far as the caretaker's department go, I think that was settled. The building removal, um, the building department has a protocol in place for asbestos removal. When we submit for our demo permit, we're going to have to submit an asbestos report and show that there was any re remediation done from an outside party. Um, that's all standard protocol with the building department. So we'll comply with that. Uh, the sanitary, um, the health department does have our application. We have a conditional approval. Uh, so we're just waiting for the meeting like this and um, a couple other small things to move that forward. Uh, but that is pretty much done in, in the works. Uh, drainage, Drew Bennett, our engineer, will coordinate with the town engineer if needed on the drainage. Uh, we believe it complies. Um, the landscaping and screening, I'd like to have Charlie Martyr come up and talk about the landscaping plan. Uh, it's designed to be an exceptional learning experience for the children here uh, and also providing necessary screening and buffering. And um, in general, we have no issues addressing the memos, concerns. We can submit heights, quantities, details on the fencing, all of that. Um, the lighting. Uh, with respect to the sign lighting, yes, we have, the, we have to go to the ARB for that. We'll use a typical gooseneck or the shielded strip lighting that they typically look for. Um, not a problem. We'll, we'll submit that to them. We actually already have submitted this application to the ARB um, and are waiting to get on their agenda. So we did start that process that you had asked last time to get that moving. Um, and I think that's it for now. If I could just uh, have Osmond come up from Nelson Pope and then Charlie to talk about the last Good evening, board members. Do you hear me? Yes. We have received your comments and um, we're going to provide responses to these comments. Oh, no, right? so we need your name. My name is Osman Barry, mm -hmm. the farm Nelson Pope, 70 Maxis Road, Melville, New York. And it's spell your list. <laughs> B A R R I E. Thanks. We have received the comments on the traffic study and we're going to provide written responses to those comments. I just want to highlight a few of them and just give you a brief response to them here. Um, the comment on the conflict on neighborhood, neighborhood House Road, the intent of making the Notary driveway entrance only was to eliminate any conflict that may happen between the driveway and neighborhood road. If you look at, if it is only an, an entrance only, the northbound traffic that's entering neighborhood road and the side drive will not have any conflict. The southbound traffic making left into neighborhood road and making left onto the side drive will, will not have any conflict. Since there's nobody exiting the side driveway at that point, there will be no conflict between the side driveway and traffic exiting neighborhood road. However, I will provide an analysis to show and update the traffic study to reflect that. And neighborhood road also has only a few homes. It is not a high traffic generator. The traffic coming out of neighborhood road will not be significant. But that being said, as I mentioned, the driveway is designed to eliminate any conflict that may have occurred if there was traffic exiting outside driveway. And also, I still in the I'm going to respond on the comment on pass by. In the traffic study, we just mentioned the pass by, but it's a possibility that people who are on their way to work will drop their kids or come back home from work will pick up their kids. But we did not take any credit for pass by, if you just mentioned the report. If the board feels we, need, we can take it out, we'll take it out because it's not affecting our analysis. The comment on, on the ITE trip generation manual, we did use, we did look at ITE and um, did ITE trip gen for 75 kids. 
in the AMP hour, 75 kills will generate only 58 trips, 37, 31 entering and 27 exit in the AM. And in the PM, it's going to be 57, 27, and 30 exiting. We are, we are using 83 trips in the AM and 90 trips in the PM. So our analysis are actually conservative based on cost compared to ITE. So, and we also update traffic study to reflect that. Going on to the comment uh, on the methodology, whatever we did not mention in the report, based on referencing the closed roadways, that will be updated in the updated traffic study. The, the traffic study did not address existing conditions. The reason why we did not have an existing conditions analysis, we only analyzed the driveways to the site and they are new. So there's no existing conditions. The prior conditions, there's no driveway there based on our analysis. However, in the report, we did mention that the project is going to only increase the traffic on the road by 2.67%. So that's the comparison between the existing as it is now and what's going to happen in the future when Project Moss is being built. And we'll, just, we'll, we'll, we'll update the study to reflect all this. Thank you very much. Hi, Charles Martyr uh, from Martyrs. Uh, we developed this the planting plans. I know we know. M A R D E R. Thank you very much, George. Um, we developed the uh, site plan uh, based on an idea, a concept that the uh, grounds should not only screen the neighbors, but they should also enhance the neighbor's view of the screening. So basically it's an interactive with the neighbors onto the site where, uh, by, by giving them trees that they normally wouldn't see uh, in, 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 in the region, uh, as well as fall colors that they wouldn't necessarily enjoy. So I think we're providing a real benefit other than say putting up a wall that we see too many times in the Hamptons that block off the wide open spaces. Um, from the inside of the property, let's call it, we've developed this uh, educational overlay, not just the landscape. Um, we've developed regions of the world and brought them into the landscape and, and compared them to other regions of the world. Uh, since trees don't uh, abide by uh, uh, property lines or national, national boundaries. Um, so we've, we've used um, the Far Eastern trees and drifted them across to European selections. We have Northeastern, America, uh, Northeastern United States and Eastern uh, and Northwestern United States and Northeastern United States. Um, and within that, we developed ideas about uh, flowering in January and February. Uh, uh, comparison uh, in the in the front, we've added more selections of oak trees. So throughout the whole thing, there's also this. Arbor, I don't think it's an arboretum, but we've brought an arboretum um, uh, level to the property. So again, it's not just another landscape uh, on a piece of property. It's it's levels of education with 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 multiple layers of benefit. Uh, so we're really, really happy and delighted with it. We've, we have prepared a list of species, sizes, and spacings, uh, and we're still, we, we feel that that's what we submit will be a minimum, and that will exceed those minimums when we actually execute the project, because uh, as, as budget and donations of people get behind this concept, we think we can upsize plant material and uh, and, and, and do a lot more educational development. Uh, so that's, that's kind of how we went about it and, and how we feel about it. And we're pretty excited about having a, having a school that actually has an education component to the outside and not feel um, like a bank or a, another institution, no offense to bankers. Uh, uh, and there was a question about existing trees on the uh, east side. Uh, there are <clears throat> there are a few trees that we want to keep back there, uh, nice big oaks, but there's a large degree of ailanthus and invasive species that we don't feel we should have to respect 
because we do want to do some elevation modifications back there with material that comes out of the excavation from the building so that we're not hauling it off site. And we want to model out in that rear section a uh, terminal moraine and teach kids about the glacier, have erratics and, and be able to show kettle holes and in, in that grade chain. So again, there's all kinds of levels of education that we want to bring to the table, which uh, hopefully will be a model for future schools. So I'm all ears. We're going to discuss the matter amongst ourselves. And if questions come up, we'll... I'm available. I'm available. Well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate all right, just so that folks know, this is not a public hearing. Uh, we know that you're here and you're interested in this project. Uh, ordinarily, this is not a time for public comment in the CEQA process, State Environmental Quality Review Act. There is a time and a place for public comment, and that's at, the, uh, at a later date. So what we'll do now is we'll turn over to uh, Ian, who is the board member with the uh, uh, point man for the uh, application. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you to the applicant. Thanks to Tina for a, a great memo. Um, you know, I really agree with the memo in terms of all of the points, the highlights, and what needs clarification. I think the applicant started to do that before us tonight, um, but I think following through in writing um, and all the details of the traffic study to make sure we get that on file will be very, very important. Um, I'll say generally speaking, you know, I'm, I'm supportive of the application. Um, I, I think that the use has been here. This is clearly an intensification. Um, they meet coverage. Um, basically all of the code standards are, are met here. I'm also respectful and appreciative of that there might be some opposition here. And I've read through those comments as well. And I think that, um, you know, before, anything goes further, we'll have to make sure that all the concerns are addressed. And I, and I certainly share some of them. Um, I guess I, I'll, I'll get right to that. My biggest concern is, is traffic, um, both on to, from the site on the Three Mile Harbor and from Three Mile Harbor into the site and internal circulation. Um, you know, I talked about the queuing last time as, as, a, as a concern. And I, I think that, well, first of all, pushing the building back 35 feet, I think was a, a very good move. Um, it's a large building. I'd be curious to hear what the Airbnb has to say about the, the overall impact and um, of the appearance. But I think moving it back is, is, is certainly helpful and allowed for a little more queuing. But that, that diagram I saw of cars lining up was, was still a concern to me. And in a couple of ways that if there's 40 kids showing up, and I appreciate they won't always be there at the same time, but the implications of any traffic backup on the Three Mile Harbor would be, would be a real concern. Um, and the way that those cars are queued, it, it illustrates as if everyone's going to do the right thing or um, know the, the approach. And I don't think that's the way that usually things work in the real world, especially if kids are involved and there's a lot going on. Um, so I'm worried that there might not be enough room if somebody stops short and that person's taking a long time to get out, that it, you know, pushes that problem back up on a three mile harbor. I have to be honest, I don't know the best solution to that. It, it would be great if there was some sort of, I, I think, frankly, one curb cut with interior circulation with a, a longer runway, so to speak, of to where you first get to drop the kids off. I also think the circulation pattern um, could risk cutting off the parking lot from the exit because, I mean, if you just look at it right now, if somebody was leaving that parking lot, um, you might be able to slip between those cars now, but not if, uh, you know, everyone's been to those mergers where it just doesn't work quite right because someone's trying to cut left and someone's trying to cut right and, and there are problems. So I, I, I have... I don't know if it's something the traffic, you know, your traffic engineer can address, um, but uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not fully convinced by, by this. I also think that we can't go too much further without the hearing from the county because I don't know how they feel about curb cuts, but generally on major arteries, they're not, you know, it's not a, an automatic thing, and and the the whole layout is really dependent right now on that. Of course, I'm concerned about neighborhood house road 
Um, I do think it's probably an improvement having the entrance there as opposed to an exit. So there's not confusion with two cars side by side trying to leave. Um, I think there's some risk though, as cars, if they're coming north to turn in there, as cars are exiting from the southern, you can almost create a conflict from the entrance and exit coming, you know, going to and coming from the site itself. So uh, I'm not saying these are insurmountable by any means, but I think for, for me, again, I'm, I'm supportive of the project. I think that Project Most does good work. I think that this it's in sort of in tune with what the site has been, but it's clearly an intensification. Um, so we just have to make sure that um, we recognize that. And, and certainly with respect to traffic, we make sure the problems don't get worse. I, I agree with all of Tina's comments about traffic, and it sounds like the applicant will address it, but I'm going to put a real emphasis on this internal circulation in terms of being important for me. And as a side note, I think our engineer and perhaps the applicant's engineer should make sure to look at um, sight lines coming in and out. You know, this is a major road, and, and uh, <laughs> the other part I'm going to talk about is, uh, is landscaping. I think uh, Mr. Martyr did a great job, has a great um, I think it's a great concept. Uh, we need more detail that sounds like it will be provided, but because of the residential quality of the neighborhood or around it, um, screening is, is, is super, super important. So uh, the more robust and, and the larger the landscaping, I think the better, but what goes along with that is making sure we don't put that in a, in a place that would at all hinder the, the, the sight lines onto Three Mile Harbor um, for cars entering or exiting. I've seen it. I've seen plans go the wrong way before by trying to put so much screening up that you create a dangerous situation where cars can't actually get you know out onto the roadway. Um, I think that generally the the, the 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 site has been improved. I think the parking on the side and and sort of isolating the space where the kids can be sort of safe from the back is good. Um, I'm not sure that the van parking space makes a ton of sense where it is, but um, is that the side that the kitchen's on? Yeah. Um, and I do think we're going to need to see just by as per the code that the truck space, although I'm not super comfortable with that being in the front because, um, you know, as somebody who's done and received deliveries and in, in, in my normal life, um, you can't always time those things. So um, I appreciate that it's a small kitchen for cooking classes and that you probably aren't going to have, you know, 18 wheelers come in there. But I think we need to have a real plan um, for where that truck would park and, and how it would be unloaded. Uh, you know, so again, generally supportive. I think the, the, the what we've heard here tonight was, was good. I've also read a lot of some criticism um and to i think piggyback on what sam said this isn't a public hearing tonight but obviously there's interested people we want to hear from the public i would encourage everybody to write to us with specific concerns the quicker we get those things on the record the better and we will we'll address them in the in the process so nobody should take um the fact that you know not everybody's invited to speak and say all of their their thoughts right now is any sort of cut off from, from participation. We want to hear specific concerns. I've already read some of them and I think welcome more when you hear from us tonight and when you read more from the applicant, the file is available to planning board offices, a lot of materials available online and everybody should really look into that. So just to wrap it up, I think that it's, it's, it's overall a good plan. And I think ironically by moving the building more interior and trying to put the parking on the side with the are generally good improvements, you just get some sort of constrained circulation issues um, that already existed. Um, and I would like to see more done with that or at least real concrete you know, explanation as to why I'm wrong to think that those, those could be problematic. Um, so, and, and then I can't emphasize enough the importance of the Department of Public Works because if, if you don't get two curb cuts, then we, you know, it's back to the drawing board. Uh, likewise, I think going for the ARB is a really good idea because they, um, in terms of the size of this building, and it's a very large building, um, you know, they might have some thoughts about, about that. So I welcome other board members. I, I might have forgotten something or might have more to say once others speak. Oh, please. Uh, on, on one map, the... Uh, you have the entry. The entry's on the north. The, the, the map you're looking is wrong. I can tell that too. Well, why is that? That's my question. Why is it there? Because I'm not convinced that that's best. 
But that's well. I, I think I would like to hear from a traffic engineer on yeah. that. Uh, my other question is uh, the procedure for drop off. I have a, and what is the what is the lowest age, the youngest age that goes to project most? Right, <clears throat> right now, it's yeah. a school age child. Well, school age child, so kindergarten. Isn't there daycare? Open as a daycare. Sir, if you want to, I appreciate it. If you don't Particularly since you're providing factual information. My name is Michael Guinan. Last name is G-U-I-N-A-N. I'm a board member for Project News. So again, the, the, the youngest is kindergarten? Right now, yes. But we uh, are applying to be a daycare provider. Okay. We have sort of a five-year plan to roll it out. And this is in direct response to community need and, and what we're hearing from our families and what people need and what we learned they need during the pandemic. Um, but we would phase it in. So we're thinking of hopefully opening in where our current operation is. We're renting for Most Holy Trinity. Um, that is because the neighborhood house um, needed so much work and it made sense in our partnership with the neighborhood house to shut that down and for us to operate elsewhere while we go through this process. Okay, so my, my question is about, uh, I, have, I have children <laughs> Many ages. Uh, the the drop off for my three year old requires I walk her to the front door. The 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 ten year old can you know run there. So I'm just and this for and even a, a five year old a kindergarten kindergartner. How is how is the procedure of driving up and dropping them off? Is there someone going to be at the sidewalk? Yeah. So the, the design here, the concept is for safety to maximize. That's why we went okay. with the two curb cuts and the one-way flow. Um, it, a, a lot of that comes from my experience working with schools around the country, and drop-off is always a, a thing, right? Um, it's you, You're always trying to make it safer and more perfect. Um, I believe that... Um, Yes, we'll definitely have people out. That's the safest way to go. And the safest way is to have a one-way flow through. Um, and that's what went into this design choice. But also the topic has been queuing and that I think having someone there would sort of kind of perhaps minimize that. So. And also having people there helps expedite the flow. Exactly. It also sets a, a standard of expectation that you don't pull up and then we start looking for his lunchbox and stuff. And you kind of build that in with the, your folks. If the first week is always the clunkiest and then, you know, you build a good routine so that it operates smoothly. Mm -hmm. Our advantage is, is that daycare is not going to all drop off at once and it's not going to pick up at once. What does daycare do in terms of your age range? So um, we we would uh, yeah we, we're looking to ultimately within five years be serving um, a six weeks to eighteen months, which are some young kids in the community that need. In addition to the care. current range. Yeah, that that's the long term plan. But we're going to go piece by piece. We're first looking at serving four year olds um, who don't have the the East Hampton schools have uh, pre K. Uh, Springs does not have a universal, um, as far as I'm aware. There's need in the community, and, and we're first going to look to respond to that. Um, you know, there's a real need for affordable child care for working parents, um, and, and our families have articulated that clearly. Um, and this uh, project um, is an expansion. Um, but when the neighborhood house was built, a little over a hundred years ago, one of its its primary function was as a nursery school for the community, um, and then it became a quarantine site. Um, our uh, proposed use, while an expansion, um, the population out here is a lot greater than it was a hundred years ago, and I think it needs a, a, a larger community center like this to meet working families' needs, and also something that has a beautiful residential feel that brings families together. Because the big part of our mission is to bring kids together and families together from all walks of life. Anybody else? And this appeals to folks. It doesn't have an industrial feel. We feel that families, you know, the whole range of families that live in uh, the town of East Hampton will uh, want to bring their kids here and want to be a part of this. Just a map question. What are these attached? Oh, garden. That's okay. Mr. Meyer, 